my name is Robert Murray Smith and I'm into graphite and graphene in a big way. If you've seen any of my other videos then you'll know that. Now the intention of this course is really to introduce you to graphene, talk a little bit about of it, about it, but predominantly it's all about how to go about making it. So it's a very practical course. Now the idea is to present you with a series of um, videos and coursework materials where you can follow them through and make graphene at home. So some of the more esoteric methods of making it I will mention as we go along, but I won't concentrate on them because in my estimation it's really quite difficult to be able to make it that way and so I don't think it's a method that really should be approached. I mean, if you have yourself a very expensive high-end lab, knock yourself out, go right for it and try some of these weirder methods. If you don't, if like me what you've got is a kitchen, a few tablespoons and some jam jars and you still want to make graphene, then that's what it's all about. It's about making graphene in the most approachable way possible. Now, making graphene is not actually an end in itself, of course. What we're making graphene for is to do something with it. And what mostly people are doing with it are um, things like supercapacitors and um, high-end batteries. And the reason they're doing that is because graphene is very, very good for that. But graphene is also very, very good for lots of things. If you were to take um, as much graphite as you find in a cat's whisker and you were to roll it out into a single sheet of graphene, you'd have enough to make a hammock that you could lie on and would take your weight. So it's an amazingly strong material. Now, if you mix that material with plastics and make wires out of them, you'll make very strong wires. You can lay them out and put them as a covering on plastics, and if you do that, it's impervious to helium. So you'd be able to make gas-filled balloons that never go down. Now, that may not seem interesting to you, but if you're a guy who wants to run an airship company, the price of helium's huge, so it's very interesting. Uh, it has a whole host of really unusual properties. It will let water through, but nothing else. So graphene can be used quite successfully for the desalination of water. So it's got tons and tons and tons of really interesting properties. And it doesn't finish there. If you modify the graphene, which is actually relatively simple to do, then you can actually make the graphene do some really exciting things. So one thing you can do is you can modify by doping it with something like phosphorus, and you'll have what's called an N-type graphene. If you make a P-type graphene, stick them both together and put some metal contacts on them, expose that to the sun, you'll actually create something called a Peltier device, and it will generate electricity. So once you've got the graphene, you can either try to use the graphene as is and make something out of it, which just uses graphene, or you can try to modify the graphene and do some really, really interesting things like super, super batteries and uh, uh, energy generation machines, water filters, all kinds of stuff. Now, it's no surprise that because of these reasons, graphene is one of the super materials. It's one of the materials that everybody wants to know about, everybody wants to make, and everybody wants to practice with. And that's really great, but it cuts us out. Those guys who are working in their garden sheds trying to invent things feel a lot of the time that it's nothing to do with them. You need a lab to make this stuff. You need a million pounds to make this stuff, but you don't. You can do this stuff at your kitchen table. And that's what this course is all about. It's how to go about doing it. Now, there are a few methods to look at and <coughs> the properties of the graphene will be altered slightly by the method that you use to produce them. And that's an important thing to think about. Now, um, I used to be a bookbinder years and years ago when I was a kid. And the a guy who taught me told me that what you really need to do is pay attention to your materials. And that made no sense to me. So I just grabbed the paper, bind it up, make my book, and hey, there was the book. Now, I always chose um, a bit of A4. Now, a bit of A4 is made in a machine where the line of the paper runs that way. And if you turn it round and print on it, so you get two A5s, fold them in half, you get actually quite a stiff book. It's difficult to read. It opens and it springs shut, it cracks the spine, and it's not a pleasant read. Then one day I was thinking about this, and I took that piece of A4 and turned it round and printed on the A5 in the middle of the A4, cut it off, bound it, and the book was beautiful. It just fell open at the right page. It was a pleasure to read. And that's what it means when it says to you, or people say to you, know your materials. Now, if you know your materials and you work within the constraints of the material, you can do some wonderful things. So the reason there are so many ways of producing graphene is that each one will give it slightly different effects. 
And if one way of producing it doesn't work, you try another way of producing it because it will alter the properties slightly and it will have a significant impact on the end product of what you want to do. So we'll be going through a few of the ways of making graphene because it's important to know them in case one way that you try doesn't actually work and you want to try another way, then you'll have that other way to be able to develop it. Now, what is graphene? Well, graphene is a really curious material in that it was theoretically studied long before it was actually found. And it was Gaim who found it with his sticky tape. And we all know the story. He got a lump of graphite, he got a lump of sellotape, put the tape on, ripped it off, and he had some graphite stuck there. Folded it over, pulled it apart, folded it over, pulled it apart. And after going through about two or three rolls of sellotape, he finally managed to get some graphene. <coughs> and graphene, under an optical microscope, looks different from graphite. Graphite's a kind of grey colour, and when you look at it under a microscope, graphene's a kind of bluey purple colour. So once he got enough on this um, tape so he couldn't see it, he stuck it in the microphone and looked for the purple. Hey presto, there were some chips. And that's what he was experimenting with, and he was the first guy to actually come across it in reality. Previous to that, it had all been theory. Now, the reason that they had the theory for it is because we all know about the 3D structure, and the 3D structure is the one we find everywhere. When you have a 3D structure that we all know, it's graphite. Graphite's the stuff you find in your pencils, it's the stuff you find in big lumps, it's the stuff that the Cumbrian farmers were wiping their sheep with to identify them. The big old 3D lump, it's graphite. Now we also have a zero dimensional lump, and they were the buckyball fullerenes. And their arrangements of carbon atoms um, in a hexagonal ring was folded over itself to make a sphere, and that sphere is only zero dimensional, and it's the buckyballs. And we also have carbon nanotubules. Carbon nanotubules are the hexagonal rings that have been rolled up into a tube, and that's the one dimensional. Then suddenly, we've got this glaring space here for the two dimensional. That two dimensional was where they theorised the graphene to be. So the graphene is just a single layer sheet of hexagonally arranged carbon atoms. Roll them up, you get a carbon nanotubule. Fold them into a sphere, you get a buckyball. Stack them all on top of each other, you get graphite. So this one wasn't actually known, it was theorised, and lots of theoretical work was done until Gein came along. Gein came along and found the hexagonal ring with the sticky tape method, and hey, presto, suddenly we had this two-dimensional material, graphene, that slotted right in this little schema, and people said, hey, wonderful. So if I join my carbons up in a low energy state, I get this hexagonal structure. If I get an awful lot of those hexagonal structures and link them all together, then what I get is a pattern like this. And this is exactly what graphene is. It's a whole series of these hexagons laying across a sheet like that. Now, if I stack those up, then what I get is a whole load of them. And that's what graphite is. Graphite is, graphite is an enormous stack of these single sheets. Give it a bit of context. If you've got about three million sheets and stack them on top of each other, you're going to have a piece of graphite about one millimeter thick. So it's an incredibly thin structure. And they got so excited about it because all that theoretical work that had been done told them it would have some wonderful properties. And yes, it does have wonderful properties. So that's where it came from and why everybody got so excited about it. Now, in order to make this stuff, <coughs> there are essentially two approaches. One's called the top-down approach and the other is called the bottom-up approach. The top-down approach is quite simple. You take the 3D material, <coughs> and you bash it, and you keep on whacking it until you get it very, very small. Essentially, that's what you're doing, okay? You're breaking up the bulk material right back down until you get to the two-dimensional material, and that's the top-down approach. You start with the big bit, and you work to the small bit. Now, obviously, there's a bottom-up approach, and the bottom-up approach is where you start with the atoms, and you try to build them back into the um, two-dimensional shape. So you'd start with your carbon atom and you'd use various methods to build it back into the sheet and that's the bottom-up approach. Now, 
the bottom-up approach extends a little bit in that sometimes you won't use carbon, sometimes you use a different precursor. Now, if you think about the carbon, the carbon, in its lowest state, wants to join up with five other carbons. And that ring is a very stable ring structure. It's got quite a low energy state, so that's what it wants to look like. It tries to get into that shape as much as it can. Now, of course, it doesn't always get into that shape. Sometimes one of these bonds is missing and you get a long chain, and that long chain is what we burn in cars. They're hydrocarbons. Now, these bonds often form, with an extra little bit on them, hydrogen, because they're dangling. Carbon wants three bonds, and it just dangles. And if it dangles, something is going to attach itself there. And if we attach hydrogens all the way around, we get benzene. Now, the hydrogens will always try to attach at the edges of the ring because those bonds don't like to dangle. But if we put loads of these rings together, we get what's called a polyaromatic poly hydrocarbon. And of course, they just get bigger and bigger. And these dangling bonds get hydrogen put on them. As they get big enough, then we start to think about graphene. Now, these polyaromatic poly hydrocarbons is another way of approaching graphene from a bottom-up approach. You can do that if you use sugar. <coughs> so, if you just get standard table sugar, you knock off all the other bits of it and you leave just the carbon, you can glue those carbons together, you'll get graphene. If you take hydrocarbons like benzene and you and knock all the hydrogen together and glue them together, toluene will do it. Pitch, tar, all that sort of stuff will be joined up and forced together in a bottom-up approach to make your graphene. And we'll be going through some ways of doing this in order to make graphene products using things like sugar and tars, that kind of stuff. Now, we don't have to do that way, of course. What we can actually do is <coughs> take the carbon atoms per se and join them together. And you can do that, and you do that over a catalyst. Normally, it's copper or nickel foil. The copper soaks in the carbon when it's hot, when it's cold it gives it back out again and as it gives it back out it joins in the ring and you get a formation of a graphene sheet on the copper. You can then dissolve the copper away and you're left with graphene. And that's what chemical vapour deposition is all about. Now don't get it into your head that you're going to make a perfect thing and that if we can make a perfect thing it's going to work wonderfully because that just doesn't happen. There are constraints in the real world that stop that happening. Now it is true if you can get a single sheet of graphene, uh, graphene and you can put an electric current across it, it will zip across the, that sheet at ballistic speeds. So in your mind you'd think well hey let's just make a sheet as big as a football field and there's going to be a winner. And yes, in theory, that's perfectly true. In practice, it's never going to happen, okay? Even if you use a system like um, a CVD, chemical vapor deposition, it's about the nearest we can get. What happens is, as I said, when the copper gets hot, it soaks up the carbon. When it gets cold, it gives it out. It doesn't give it out at a little point and grow from that point. It gives it out at lots of different points. So here's our bit of copper. It begins to cool and it'll start cooling here and here, and here, and here, and as it cools, these centers will grow outwards until they meet each other. And when they meet each other, they will have grown in different directions. So this one maybe is growing that way, this one's growing that way, this one's growing that way, this one's growing that way, and where they meet, they create boundaries. Those boundaries are weak points. So one of the big problems is CD, CVD graphite, is those weak points will actually break. They'll snap apart and it makes it very, very difficult to make an entire sheet as big as a football field. It just can't be done. Even if you get the copper to be a monocrystalline copper, it's still not going to work. So don't get it into your head that you're going to be able to do the perfect job. It's not going to happen. You're going to be able to do the best job you can do with the given materials. And as I say, know your materials, accept the limitations and work within those limitations. Once you get hold of that idea, you're going to be uh, an awful lot better off than searching for perfection. Searching for, for perfection is going to be an absolute waste of time. Search for the method that most approaches what you want to do with your graphene. You may now, graphene, using uh, the graphene, um, graphene oxide process, and you use very small powders, say about 5 micrometers, which is um, about the same size as a blood cell. 
and, and you can get them. So if you use a very small powder like this, you will get a very high yield when you do your process, sort of 90-95% yield, you get an awful lot of graphene oxide out of it. Those graphene oxides are going to be very, very small, and that introduces a whole lot of other problems. If you use a larger powder, say something about uh, 350 microns, something like that, when you take the water out of that graphene, what you'll get is a gel, it's like a jelly. And that jelly can actually be spun into fibres, and they're doing it. They're sp electrospinning it or um, putting it in through a nozzle into sodium hydroxide and making fibres out of it, and they're making very strong cables using this larger jelly-like substance. The problem with jelly-like substance is it's incredibly hard to wash because it's a jelly. So you get all your end of reaction, you've got all this stuff floating around in there, you try to clean it up so all you have is graphite, and it takes weeks because it's really hard to wash. This stuff washes really, really easily. But because it's so much smaller, it doesn't form a jelly when you um, start to evaporate the water away. So it's very useful for things like um, solution casting, but very bad for things like making fibres. So even this part, the powder size that you start with will have an intimate effect on your end result. And we'll be talking about some more of these things as we go through the course. But it's all about knowing your materials and balancing your expectations to meet the materials that you have in front of you. Okay, when you start to think about the limitations of what you're working with, then you can actually start to come up with some strategies to overcome those limitations. Again, working with your materials. So let's take graphene sheets that are quite small. And the problem with them is they either don't meet to the boundaries or they meet to the boundaries and those are weak points. Now, there is a really simple way of dealing with that. Put a bridge on it. And that's what they're actually doing. Now, those bridges are being made out of carbon nanotubules or metal nanowires. And you can make copper metal nanowires, mix them with your graphene, and those wires will lay over those weak areas and act as conducting points. Because across the sheet, the electron is transmitted at ballistic speeds until it reaches the edge. When it reaches the edge, it can't get over the edge. And um, graphene, if we think about it in this way, conducts electrons very, very rapidly that way, and is actually quite insulating that way. So trying to get over an edge is a real challenge. If we put a lot of little metal nanowires or some carbon nanotubules on there to act like little bridges, then it'll cross that gap really, really easily. And that's what's been done. People are making uh, carbon nanowires, metal nanowires, and mixing them with the graphene, laying out a thin sheet, and getting very good conductivity across the sheet. And thinking of well, the use of this thing, this thing is very good for things like um, transparent conductive screens. So if you want to make a touch screen or a, a, a solar cell um, screen, something like that, then you would use a strategy like this. But you can only think about those strategies if you're aware of the limitations of the material that you're working with. So again, know your materials. Once you know your materials, you'll be able to look at the strategies that you can use to overcome those limitations. This being a fine example of one of them. One of the easier methods is a top-down approach. A top-down approach traditionally uses something called graphene oxide. So what we do is we take the graphite, beat it into little, uh, little pieces so we get some graphite powder. Then we wrap that powder to form something called graphene oxide. Actually, it's graphite oxide at this stage. Now, graphite oxide is a little bit of a misnomer. It's one of those names that is to come across historically from when this was first done, because it's not just adding oxygen into something. What it actually adds are these groups. And instead of having the hydrogen on those dangling bonds that we saw earlier, we get these forming, the carboxyl and hydroxyl groups. And they'll either attach at the edges of the uh, graphite, or they'll form in the middle of it. Now these things quite happily give up their hydrogen to take a charge. And once you've got them in a charge like that, it'll dissolve in water. So the good thing about graphite oxide is it's water soluble. Actually, it strictly isn't water soluble. Actually, it's water dispersible, because the water will surround all of these and pull off the lumps and hold it in suspension. And because it'll do that, breaking up graphite oxide into single sheets in suspension to make graphene oxide is really, really easy. 
all you have to do is put it in a sonicator and um, gently sonicate it for about 10 or 15 minutes. The whole thing will disperse and you'll get a solution of graphene oxide. You can then take the graphene oxide and take it back to graphite, and sorry, to graphene, and you have a solution of graphene. So the most popular, the most common method of doing the top-down approach is this route to go through the graphite powder, oxidise it, put it into solution and then reduce it back. And once it's in solution, of course, you can do really interesting things with it, like solution cast it. So you can drop it onto a piece of a material plastic, you spin the plastic very quickly, and you get a very thin layer. It's much, much easier to manipulate. All of these things have problems associated with them. So this method introduces defects, and it wrinkles up the sheets. So when you get it back to your graphene, it's not as good as if you'd actually used pristine graphene. But you can accept that. There's a degree at which you can accept it. So if you get a layer of these things, so you've got a layer like that, another layer crossing over it, you will get conductivity along that sheet. Wouldn't be as good as if you had a whole sheet of graphene that big, but your chances of being able to get a whole sheet of graphene that big are very, very small. Okay, so once we've got our graphene, the question then becomes, what on earth do you do with it? Now, there are lots of things you can do with it, depending on which form you have it in. Now, all the original work was done on getting graphene. Then they were looking at modifying the graphene, and then they were looking at building structures from the graphene. And that's where we're really at. We're really at building structures from modified graphene. The getting the graphene bit isn't so interesting to anybody anymore. There's still a search for a better method of getting graphene, but it's not as hectic as it was, say, about two or three years ago. Now it's moved. Now everything's all about how to build structures out of it and how to modify it to do a better job than the uh, job that original graphene will do. The original graphene actually doesn't have that many useful properties. The whole point of it really is it's easy to modify and it has some interesting properties. The big difference between interesting and useful when we get the graphene, what we have to send think to, uh, what we're going to do with it is literally what are we going to do with it. Now, on the single sheet stuff, you can do some amazing things with transistors. You can work on solar cells, you can work on um, fuel cells, you can work on um, solar production of hydrogen, you can work on um, batteries, you can work on supercapacitors. Loads and loads of things are using this single sheet. But that is not the end of it. If you can roll those sheets up and entangle them, so you get a chain of tangled up, rolled up, scrunched up sheets, a bit like wool actually, and you spin them into long fibres, you can make a material that's stronger than steel, or will conduct electricity along a wire better than copper. And there's work being done on that. If you can link up the sheets Like this, you can make a foam structure. And if you can make a foam, again, this monolithic porous network of graphene will have even more interesting properties. And that's been done, and that's been done for things like supercapacitors. <coughs> the important thing about supercapacitors is not the size of them, but the accessible volume, and that's a product of surface area. An accessible volume is the volume to which the reactants can get to. And if it's a uh, microcellular or uh, mesoporous sponge like this, in a small area, you can put an enormous volume, and all you have to do is think about your lungs. Your lungs have the volume of a tennis court, all packed inside here, because it's a very, very small, porous structure, all rolled up into a tight package. And that's what the 3D graphene sponges are all about. And again, they do some amazing things. So you need to think about um, expanding your thoughts a little bit from graphene per se to what do you want to do with it at the end of the day? And when you think about what you want to do with it at the end of the day, it is going to help dictate what kind of process you want to approach. Now, a better example of this <coughs> is the rather famous um, light scribe method of making supercapacitors. So what they're doing, they make graphene oxide and they put it onto a, a disc and they lay on the graphene oxide, then they hit it with a laser light um, from a light scribe drive, which is a normal computer drive. This turns the graphene oxide back to graphene and it makes a very good supercapacitor. There's a very good reason it makes a very su good supercapacitor, because when the light hits the graphene oxide and turns it back to graphene, it doesn't do it as a flat sheet. What it does is cup the sheet up. 
and you get a series of cup formations that are accessible to the rest of the supercapacitor materials. And the reason the light scribe graphene supercapacitor works so well is because what we've actually formed is a very thin foam on the surface of the CD. So that, as a method of making supercapacitors, is excellent. It's appalling as a method of making transistors because there's too much wasted volume. As a transistor, all you want is a single sheet. So CVD graphite is, be is better. If you want something to replace indium oxide, so you're creating a see-through con see conductive screen, this method to Pauling really would be a waste of time. So if you're looking at supercapacitors, you need to be looking at different ways of doing it than you would if you were looking at making a touchscreen, for instance. So have an idea in your head what it is you want to approach. That will help define the methodology that you're going to use to approach that. And again, these are things we're going to talk about as we go through the course. There's some of the basics about graphene and about why we make this stuff and what this stuff is all about. And the rest of this is going to be on the individual methods on how to go around making it. So what I'm sure you're getting from this is that um, the subject of graphene and what to do with graphene and how to make graphene is enormous. There's a huge amount of work done on it. There's something like 3,000 papers come out a month. So there's an enormous amount of work. It's a very interesting field. There's a huge amount of things going on. And it's not really possible to cover it in a short course like this. Um, you get a university degree of three years on this. So we're going to really highlight on methods of making graphene, different ones for different purposes, some of the methods of overcoming the limitations, and some of the things that you can do with it, and how to approach making some of these things that we're all interested in. So that's where we're going to go from here. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this introduction. I hope there was some information in there that you found useful, and I look forward to speaking to you again in the rest of the course. Thank you very much for watching.